I mean, weirdly, as obvious as it seems, you have to understand as a business person that in almost all cases, there's a few exceptions, but in almost all cases, you're mostly interested in the data, not the program. I'm joined today by Dave McComb. He's the president and co-founder of Semantic Arts. He and his team help organizations like Procter & Gamble, Golden Sachs, Dun & Bradstreet, Morgan Stanley uncover the meaning of data from their information system. Dave is also the author of The Data-Centric Revolution, Software Wasteland, and Semantics in Business Systems. Thanks for joining me today, Dave. Yeah, Jason, thank you. So what do people need to watch for when they start their data-centric revolution? I guess the first thing is, is to recognize where you are. You know, um, a lot of people want to de describe what the, what the future state looks like and all that kind of stuff, but I think you have to understand how bad your current state is. I mean, that's what a lot of software wasteland was all about, was, was how people have somehow convinced themselves that projects that could cost, you know, one or two million, they budget them at 50. And by the time they're at a hundred million, they realize they're now a hostage to their vendor. And these things, you know, I, one of the stories I talk about in the book was, was how healthcare.gov started life as, as the peculiarly precise $93.7 million. You know, you can go out and research this stuff and find it. And by the time it launched, they had already spent 500 million. It was a terrible system as everybody who tried to use it that week, including myself, found out. And, and the, the version that we currently have was $2 billion in total. Several people have come in and saved the day for a mere 500 million and all that kind of crap. But the literal truth is <clears throat> it wasn't even a $100,000 project. Some people from healthcare.sherpa built the exact same thing, team of three or four people over two or three months. I've, I've interviewed them. I interviewed their CEO. Um, it really wasn't a very complicated system at all. If you're looking at hundreds of millions of dollars to implement a system, you should immediately stop and rethink that. The, the metaphor that I use is uh, you imagine yourself on the one yard line looking down another 99 yards. You don't plan your end zone celebration right now. <laughs> that, that's the launch. Right. That's the end game. You have to run a number of plays to get you there. You're going to have setbacks. You're going to have turnovers. And eventually you're going to get there. But without thinking through your strategy for the next 99 yards, you'll never get to that end zone play. Why do you, why is it that organizations skip straight to the end zone? Think, okay, we're going to launch tomorrow and be damned with the planning. Is it just not standardized? Is it just not well known what that planning should be? One of the things that, that people have to realize what's become sort of the new normal is what we call the application centric quagmire. And it, it sort of became the new normal, you know, way back when, when you're implementing your first computer system, you know, it's probably a payroll system, you know, solving that one problem was, was a great thing to do. And then you had dozens and hundreds and, you know, most of our clients now have thousands of systems. <clears throat> and every time they have a new problem, let's go launch another application project because that is nice and bounded and we can solve it and have a, have a victory celebration. Like you say, we, we were already in the end zone because we've picked this package, but you know, the literal truth is, firstly, implementing those applications has gotten incredibly difficult because of the other thousand applications. You know, it's mostly a systems integration project. And they, you know, the more things you try to tie to it, the more pieces you bring in, the more complex it gets. And because that's all we've ever known, people just keep doubling down on that. And it just keeps getting bigger and bigger. Yeah, and, and it's in those fringe points, and that's, that's something that uh, when I was talking to John Mancini, former past president of AIM and, and consultant in this in the data governance industry, it's something that he identified, especially in wake of uh, like the, the pipeline, the colonial pipeline and these types of things. It's the fact that vendor application gets deployed and then another vendor, but the integration points and the data flow between the systems and the process 
and the data centric view is never taken. Therefore, it's, it's in those jumps between systems that it's trivially easy to attack and people never really think of them as they, as they start to integrate. I, I believe even the techniques that we use to purchase software as big organizations, you put out a feature request RFP or an RFI, and then a vendor will bid it feature for feature, not focused on outcomes. Is that one of the things where we shoot ourselves in the foot? Yep. The longer your requirements checklist, the more complex a system you're going to get, whether that's what you want or not, because in order to check all those items in the checklist, you need a, a giant system that's been around for all forever and can do it all. And at some level, being able to do it all sounds great, but actually, you know, in, in, in practice, it isn't. And, and it, what ends up killing you is there's this level of complexity that is, is almost hard to imagine. I was on a call the other day and I mentioned that one of our clients just did a data profile project and discovered that they have 70 million columns under management. That's not 70 million rows, that's 70 million columns amongst the thousands of systems they have and thousands of data sets and various other things. Um, <clears throat> now, nobody can understand and or manage 70 million concepts. And when you especially just put that in contraposition to what you actually need, every large enterprise we've gone into, we design an enterprise ontology, which is a high level model of the concepts you actually need to, to run your company. It's typically around 500, not 500,000 or anything even remotely close to 70 million. Um, so there's, there's such a, a staggering gap and, and some of the systems you can buy these days have already a million columns. You know, if you if you implement SAP, you're depending on how you configure it, you're picking up 90 to 100,000 tables and close to a million columns. That's just added into the 70 million you already have and just, you know, keep going. Yeah, like it's I'm imagining awfully complex worlds out there of like if I'm shopping at Best Buy or something like that, I couldn't imagine having 76 million facets to choose from. Yeah, no. It, that's silly. And <clears throat> I can't imagine how organizations would even want that. But I get how it happens. Like, I mean, you hire a co-op student, they make an access database, and now it becomes part of your master data. Right. Uh, and so there's a normalization that must happen, and your organization is, is doing that. Does the customers always want to conflate that with too many other things? Like, well, if I'm going to do normalization of this content, shouldn't I be doing data lakes and analytics and data science and five other things that forget that you're still standing at the start line? Yeah. Yeah. In fact, data lakes is a classic admission of defeat. You know, that we had data warehouses and people were at least attempting for a while to conform all their various systems into a, a relatively simple you know, set of fact tables and dimension tables. But of course, two things happened. One, that just the, the demand and the speed, people just started rushing things into their data warehouse to where the typical data warehouse now has tens of thousands of tables, which is sort of defeats the purpose. But even that wasn't fast enough. And people said, no, we're acquiring data at such a rate, we can't bother with this normalization. Just throw it in the data lake and we'll come get it later. And of course, you, you, know, you know what happens there. There's just a bunch of junk in the data lake. Then you have a new project. Well, let's curate the data lake and, uh, you know, God. <laughs> well, maybe it, talk to me about how you can explore uh, it, in, in your writings, in your books, and, and with your customers, turning this whole idea of, okay, we're going to dump it here, we're going to do this project, turning them into programs that are continually realigning the data. It's, it, how, yeah. does, how does somebody start doing that as an organization? Yeah, we, we have this, this methodology we call think big, start small. And the, the start small part is obvious. Everybody wants to start small. Uh, everybody wants to be agile, you know, that, that, in fact, we advocate, don't do a $50 million project, don't do a $100 million project, do a small project that's going to prove something. <clears throat> but if that's all you do, you run the danger of 
creating yet another silo. You know, most small projects, most agile things are yet another silo, and that's what we're trying to get past. So the reason we have to think big and start small running in parallel is the think big part says, do at least enough of your enterprise ontology to cover the concepts that you're going to have in this start small thing in a way that is future proof. And you know, as you do the next several projects or dozens of projects, that it will just sort of grow organically without having to be refactored and start over again. So that's a, that, you know, and so once you get that going and once you've got, you know, some subset of your data scape in, an, in a knowledge graph, conform to a simple ontology, you're getting some value out of it, you're starting to grow it out. Then people look at it and say, oh, that's what you were talking about. An agile project, of course, can fail, but you fail so much faster and so much more efficiently than a big right. project that, that runs over. Could we quantify that? Maybe you could contrast an example of, of a one that started off as a wedge and then grew into something big and successful versus something that started off as the monolith and then grew into an elephant that never solved the problem. Yeah. But we did the, we did the monolith with, with healthcare.gov. I think one of the one of the best examples of something that started small and grew organically very nicely. Um, there's a hospital system in New York City called Montefiore. It includes the Albert Einstein Hospital, and it's mostly in the Bronx. <clears throat> um, and uh, seven or eight years ago, um, you know, initially did several projects just with. NIH grants and NSF grants, you know, they'd get a 500,000 here, a million here, and they'd have a three or four person project, but they were constantly adding on to where now they have, they have two incredible assets. One is they have pretty much all of medical knowledge in a knowledge graph and all integrated. You know, a lot of people have SNOMED and LOINX and IC9 and MESH and all that stuff, but poorly integrated. This thing is, is very well integrated to where you can interrogate for almost any kind of rare condition and drug drug interaction and all that stuff. But that's actually the small part of their solution. The big part is they now have all 3 million of their patients, every bit of data they have about them from radiology and lab and EMR and scheduling and billing and all that stuff is also in this giant knowledge graph, hundreds of billions of triples integrated with the medical knowledge such that you know they can overnight look at certain patients and and you know recommend treatments and have you considered this and um, they're, they're getting benefits all over the place they I was talking to Parsa who's the guy who heads this up <clears throat> they did a project um, you know hospitals required to do sepsis reporting you know if you get infected in the hospital that's pretty nasty it's fairly deadly therefore there's lots of regulators that are looking over your shoulder constantly. They had a team of 12 people that did nothing but sepsis reporting back to the government because what happens is <clears throat> you gather little bits of, of the case from all the different systems and you package it up in a document and send it to the regulators and they spot the out points and wait a minute, you said this here and you this drug there and did it. Now, because everything is in the graph and it's all harmonized and connected, they, they just generate the report from the graph, give it to the regulators. And the first time they did this, the regulators came back and said, God, this has never happened. There's no inconsistencies in this report. Therefore, you don't have to do any more work and thank you very much. And, and they just reassigned all 12 of those people because you know all they were doing was massaging data to give to regulators. So that, that's amazing to me, and I'd, I'll, I'll throw out what I hope is an apt metaphor, is that uh, so it's not just telling people you can't do a big bang, it's actually demonstrating that this graph, unlike a waterfall-based project, is actually going to grow organically mm -hmm. as you test and add more information and test and add more information and test and add more information, and it will become its own ecosystem as opposed to becoming a functional product and then start. So it, it almost, yep. it just mimics real life is that we will evolve or we will <laughs> adapt to our environment regardless of the words that you wanna use. We will adapt to our environment that's given to us. 
And it seems like the data and the use of the data is going to adapt to that environment, but only if you give it a life cycle and a chance to do that. I mean, weirdly, as obvious as it seems, you have to understand as a business person that in almost all cases, there's a few exceptions, but in almost all cases, you're mostly interested in the data, not the program. You know, you're, it, it's, it's the data about the sepsis. You don't really care how you got it or which program or how many pipelines or any of that stuff. You know, both the somebody trying to, to you know, help somebody who's, who's got an infection or a regulator who's trying to look over your shoulder and say, you know, why didn't you intervene sooner or whatever they ask? I don't know. It's, it's about the data. <clears throat> and yet we try and solve the problem with programs. And, I, you know, until you, until you recognize that we've got it backwards, I don't know that we're going to make much progress. Well, isn't it this just a function of the fact that, oh, that sounds like a computer thing. Let's hand it to IT. Yeah, exactly. IT doesn't really understand the business. So <laughs> yep. IT can go, oh, well, I understand ones and zeros. So I will deliver the, the uh, tools and then you make up the rules. And, it's, and I have been hearing more and more about uh, the uh, line of business controlling the budgets. Like, mm -hmm. And IT now has become becoming the stewards, the guards, yeah. and, and they're doing a good job of that. But unfortunately, software vendors are still forced to kind of come through the IT door. And you, as soon mm -hmm. as you talk to the line of business, they punch you over there and say, well, get through them first because <laughs> I don't want to have to learn the technology. So isn't that a bit right. of a disconnect? Interesting that there's a there's a little bit of hope now, you know, from I don't know when it was, it must have been about the year 2000, about the year 2010, seemed to be the height of outsourcing, you know, where so many large companies had had just turned over their IT department wholesale to some third party vendor. And what that did is made it even more unlikely that business could drive change, you know, because you're one, one degree even further removed. And, you know, there are all kinds of contractual and budgetary things that kind of kept the status quo in place. But our observation is <clears throat> more and more of our clients have, have reversed that nowadays. They, I don't, I'm not seeing outsourcing nearly as much as we used to, which is good. And as you suggest, the line of businesses are starting to take over the budget again. In fact, even though it's a buzzword, it's it's a useful one. This whole idea of digital transformation. I mean, that's a, if there ever was a buzzword, you know. But what it is doing is is providing uh, the line of business an excuse to take over IT functionality. Yeah, it's if they're the primary beneficiary and they can understand it and they can best set up the the rules, then. It, they should be driving the tools as well. It, it does make sense. It, touching on how, how do we help uh, like big five consultants and integration companies and these types of things get on the trolley as well? Because touching on what you described there before about once you've outsourced a lot of this uh, IT and managed services and these types of things, now you've got organizations who are running these programs working to a SLA instead of to an outcome. So how do we bring those types of integrators along as well in a way that maintains their SLA, but still makes them look good and innovative? I don't think it's gonna happen. <laughs> okay. I, I, I think the, the economics and the business model of the large integrators are such that, that you know, if you could convince them that that $100 million project they just did actually could have been done for a million, even if they believe that, which I don't think they do. I think they think they're that smart and only people as clever as us could have possibly gotten that done for hundred million. If they believed it was 1 million, you got two problems. Do you charge your client hundred million and incur 1 million and keep 99 million in profit? It's harder to do that than you think. You're, you really do have to show up with a lot of smart bodies that are actually getting in each other's way. Um, you know, to, to incur those kinds of costs. And, and it's hard to, it's hard to bill when you're not incurring the cost. <clears throat> and then if they, even if they did realize that, if they believed it, they'd sit there and think, gee, $100 million project is, you know, at least for them, relatively easy to sell. They're pretty good at it. They know how to do that. Are you telling me I'd have to go sell, you know, a hundred, 
yeah, a hundred one million dollar projects just just to get the same margin I'm getting off one project. Why would I do that? Selling is hard, you know. I I just I don't think they're going to go there. Yeah, and it, and we sound like two software vendors talking right now because it is <laughs> it is the truth. Like I mean, when you're entrepreneurial, you're always trying to find a way to drive down the cost because you need to be a ten x. Uh, however, it seems like what you're displacing is is contrary to that. Yet, a lot of the thought leadership for customers has been kind of also outsourced to these organizations as well. Yeah, I, I think what's going to change the world is, is when business decides that they're really going to run their own destiny, if you will, because they've, they've sort of first they deferred it to IT and then IT in turn deferred it to the vendors. You know, the vendors know better. Well, no, I don't, I don't know. They do. I think, I think once a business decides, no, actually we, we, we can take it from here is where the real progress is going to come from. I agree. Like it's, it's, there was that old adage is nobody ever got fired for hiring IBM, but I know people that have been fired for hiring IBM, despite the <laughs> fact that I have lots of friends who work at IBM and I, I, I like them and they're sincerely working hard to deliver, but there's no such thing as that magic bullet organization out there that's going to guarantee success when you're trying to digitally transform or, or change your business.